my mystic power. I will make no attempt to properly introduce the speaker, but merely to say to you, there was a man sent from God whose heart was filled with the word of the Lord and the anointment of the Holy Spirit was upon him. And in his heart there was great love and great zeal for preaching the gospel of Christ. And he has come to New Mexico to share his heart with us. And his name is R.G. Lee. Amen. Brother Chairman and dear friends, I'm happy indeed to be present tonight to try to speak for the Lord from my heart to your hearts. And I ask your earnest prayers I shall come try to speak to you on the subject that was assigned to me, which is not a new subject because I preached it a long time ago. The menace of mediocrity. I got this subject mainly from three portions of the scripture, Ecclesiastes 10 and 16, War to the old land when thy king is a child. From 1 Corinthians 14 and 20, where Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and said, Brethren, in understanding be not as children, in understanding be as men. Luke the 7th chapter and the 31st and 32nd verses where Jesus the greatest teacher the world has ever had can ever have will ever have said this to what shall I liken the men of this generation to what they're like they like it unto children playing in the marketplace you turn to the dictionary and the dictionary defines mediocrities of average excellence just ordinary. Joy Gellert in one of her great books has a character whom she named Amos Barton. She said about old Amos this, he was superlative in nothing unless it was in being superlatively middling, the quintessential extract of mediocrity. Let me say that again. He was superlative in nothing unless it was in being superlatively middling, the quintessential extract of mediocrity. I'm not crude and I'm not rude when I say some people are bad em when they should be big, they're midgets when they should be giants, they go on the devil's back end streets instead of Jesus' highway and find the tragedy and folly of such before they go very far. A mediocrity is a person who plays only ten strings on a thousand string hog. Like a man who plows only four furrows when he has ten to plow. Like a big battleship that we used to have with 24 guns, 8, 6 inch and 16, 16 inch guns when the enemy presses to the battle use only four or five of these guns. Mediocrity, a mediocre person is like a stenographer with two bright keen eyes and ten super fingers who shuts one eye and uses three fingers at a typewriter. A mediocre person is like an organist who has power to make the organ breathe forth the whispers of God and yet is content with the wheezy, mournful monotony of a jangling in harmony of a saxophone. A mediocre person is one who's like a farmer who has a tool house full of McCormick reapers, and all kinds of tools, who uses the scythes which the Babylonians used in the Euphrates Valley to cut his wheat. A mediocre person is a person who weighs small on God's scales when he could weigh worthy, who measures short by God's measuring rod when he could measure tall. We are afflicted in our world with the menace of mediocrity. Now, I'm not criticizing people. I'm not sitting in 
condemnation on anybody nor on judgment on anybody. I'm trying to tell you what I as a spiritual physician have found out after 62 years of preaching that there is such a thing as a menace of mediocrity among folks, among Baptist people, among Christians. Goldsmith said when they talked of Corregos and such stuff, he just shifted his trumpet and took a sniff of snuff. Now, Goldsmith didn't use the word mediocrity, but he meant that when he said what he did. Phyllis Brooks wasn't talking about mediocrity, or at least he didn't use that word when he said it's time for Boston to get out of the peck measure into the bushel measure. General Omar Bradley said, we have too many men of science and too few men of God. He set forth a tragedy of the menace of mediocrity when he said we have men who are nuclear giants and spiritual pigments. The Larry's Freeman Palmer knew something about the shadow of mediocrity falling on her mind and heart when she tried to get some rich people to give her some money for her college and they refused. She went home and said they live in great big houses but they're little bits of folks. <laughs> Mr. Watkinson, who I think is one of the greatest thinkers we've had in, in the Christian thought of the world in the last generation, said this, it will live in a time of great unsown and unreaped areas, sorrowfully incomplete beginnings. We live in a strange world of the undone. And reading about Mr. Gladstone, the biographer attracted me when he said two things about him. I'll give you just one of them now. He would not compromise with mediocrity. And he said about mediocrity, it's a very rare thing to see our poets and our writers r rise above the dead level of mediocrity. Some people talked about okay, the occasional evil of mediocrity when they said about Mr. Wordsworth, he made his poetic ego do the work of a crooking hen. And Mr. Wordsworth himself set forth the evil of mediocrity when he said about some people, they have that shallow stream of piety that runs on Sabbath days a pressure course. Phyllis Brooks again said, we live at a time when there's a preponderance of mediocrity, just average living, which presses life down to the dead level, which does not make people beneficiaries of wisdom. And I love to think about Tom Thumb. Tom Thumb was a little tiny baby when he was born of the people named Stratton, a little New England town. They called him Charles Sherwood, but he wasn't known as Charles Sherwood Stratton. Mr. P.T. Barnum, the circus man, got hold of this little tiny fellow. He was 14 years of age and weighed 16 pounds at 14 years of age. And from then on, he was known as General Tom Thumb. He never was over one foot and 10 inches high and never weighed over 25 pounds in his life, even when he got fed. He himself wished it to get so fat he'd have to get up on a stump to spit. But anyway, I don't think we have any physical Tom Thumbs much more in the world. I see some of these great tall football boys talk about little Tom Thumb physically. We don't have many Tom Thumbs in the physical world anymore. We have a multitude of Tom Thumbs in the spiritual world who are little folks when they could be big folks. Sam Jones said some folks are so small if you spit on them they'd drown if they couldn't swim. <laughs> now he's talking about the menace of mediocrity. Mr. Emerson said there are people who come down to titmouse dimensions. And Mr. Lowell talked about people who contracted their firmament to the compass of a tent. And Lord George, the great Baptist statesman, said about England before the Second World War broke out, and he said it in a critical means, in a critical way, and he said it with lamentation and heartache more than he did with criticism. He said, England has let the roar of the lion become the squeak of the mouse and the voice of authority and impotent whisper. Now, he didn't mention the word mediocrity, but he said it forth when he talked about a nation 
that had let the roar of the lion become the squeak of the mouse and the voice of authority and impotent whisper. Dr. Frank Crane wrote many essays. I think I read every essay he ever wrote. I have a set of his books and I wouldn't sell them or give them away unless I'm about ready to die. And he said this, and I'm quoting just exactly as I can remember it, and I can remember pretty well even if I am not as young as some of you folks are. He said, most preachers are bad, not bad men, but bad preachers. He said, most singers really can't sing. Most teachers are mediocre teachers. He said, most books are not worth reading. But many of women are bad housekeepers. And he said, uh, uh, if you get a good job done from a plumber or a carpenter, you have to stand over with a club to get it done. He said, most houses are not fit to live in. He said, most crooks can't really cook. And I think of some young ladies who've gone to college and got magna cum laude on their diploma. Some of them summa cum laude, and some of them cum laude, and some of them deserved old laude. <laughs> And if they lose the can opener, their husband goes, goes hungry. One young fellow married a girl like that. She was beautiful. She was sweet and kind and gracious, but she didn't know how to cook. One day he came home from the office. They'd been married about a month, and she was all flushed, and oh, she was all fluttery and flushy. And she was sobbing. She said, well, dear, what are you crying about? She said, I had some biscuits. Oh, you and the dog ate them. He said, don't cry, honey. We'll get us another dog. We'll get us another dog. <laughs> now, there's a menace of mediocrity in the kitchen. And how refreshing it is to time from uh, something like that to hear what one man said about a preacher who was also a teacher. God kept him on double duty as a teacher and a preacher for 50 years. And he reminded me of a golden galleon singing, uh, sailing among battered craft. We come to think of what Dr. T. T. Shields of Canada said, and I heard him say it. He said, it may be I don't know how to think or write. He said, but according to my evaluation, the art of preaching is a lost art. Now, I'm just quoting. I'm not accusing anybody. The art of preaching is a lost art. We have many emotional, hysterical entertainers and many people who in dealing in prophecy go beyond what the Word says. We have so few sane, solid expositors of the Word of God, the greatest book of all age. Somebody said about Lord Byron, and I love this poetry. Sometimes I've said of half a night, seeing how that marvelous poet could reach from pole to pole with the wings of his poetic fancy. Do you know what somebody said about him when he was guilty occasionally of mediocrity? He said he prostituted genius to temporary popularity as a theatrical trumpery. Dr. Vance Havner, whom I've known a long time, was in Memphis, and I heard him say this. He said, salvation of a lot of folks had become a nightcap instead of a helmet. A lot of people sing lustily in the choir on Sunday and live lustfully in the world during the week. He said, an average check when the piano has to be moved, most of the men jump for the stool. <laughs> Long time ago, though Shakespeare didn't mention the word mediocrity, he, he set it forth when he said, the world has become so bad that rams make prey where eagles once soared. So we come to think, what some people have said about mediocrity. Brother Brian up beyond in Virginia when I held a meeting in his church wrote an article and in that article is what he said. He said, our churches have reached a critical hour in their world's history but they're not ready for this hour. They're not ready in faith and love and sacrifice and service and daring for the Lord God. Professor Milan of Chicago University is called a professor of constructive theology. I hope it is constructive and not theology, and not destructive, I mean. I hope he's not one of these liberals that goes nowhere so fast he rides out of breath, talking more and more of less and less. 
But he makes us squirm with these words. He said that the prevailing model of the church is mediocrity. He uses that word. He said that the architecture, the choir, the singing of the choir, the preaching, the prayers, the, the uh, parish talk, and the celebrations are mediocre. He said, God from the doors of the churches goes a ministry and a teaching that spreads mediocrity over the whole community. He said, mediocrity has gotten a hold of us as a people. He said, it's a deadening disease. And then we let comfort and happiness and our way have priority. Then we make life shrink up to the narrow dimensions of mediocrity. That's what he said. I knew Dr. O.P. Gilbert. I'm glad I, he and I were friends. He was editor of the Christian Index in Atlanta, Georgia for years. One of the last editorials he wrote, which I filed away, said this. said, the deadening force upon Southern Baptist life is mediocrity, he uses the word. Said at a time when the center of, of gravity has been shifted, and what our forefathers died for and lived for is debated among the nations with favorable comment. When when the common man has never had so much power as he has now, the common man has gotten further from our churches than he's ever done, and the deadening disease in Southern Baptist life is mediocrity. I know we don't want to hear that. No, many times we don't want anybody to tell us where we're wrong. And we resent people showing us where our shortcomings are. The reason some of us are not better singers, better preachers, better teachers, better preachers, and better Christians is because we resent anybody who shows us where we're wrong. They don't want to be criticized for our shortcomings, for our mediocrities that possess us. Priest in our church one Sunday morning, a man came by four different Sunday mornings and said, I didn't write your sermon. I treated him nicer for three times. The fourth Sunday morning he came around with a big frown on his face and said, I didn't like your sermon. I liked it less than the last three. I said, The devil didn't like it either. Testify yourself and come back next Sunday. <laughs> So when I quote these things that men have said and women have said about mediocrity, I'm not trying to be hurtful. I'm trying to be helpful. And we need to let people show us where our shortcomings are. Dr. Houghton, who died as president of Moody Bible Institute, great, big, tall, black-headed man. He and I stood together up there in a Bible conference once, and a dear little Christian woman came up and said, I saw you and Dr. Houghton up there. You know what prayer I prayed? I prayed that you'd live as long as, as he did. Uh, God answered the prayer because he died in six months. And I've outlived him by over 20 years. But here's what he said. He said, it used to be the old-time Christians sang onward Christian soldiers marching as to war. See, the modern-day Christian, many of them can substitute for marching the word limping. He said they're limping from tight shoes, not worn on battlefields, but on the broadways and realities of the world. He said, what a tragic, pathetic sight. It ain't for angels to look upon, look down upon powerless, puny Christians in a world of despair that men face. Find so much mediocrity in marital relationships and what we call home life today. Home to a lot of young people, just a place where they stay while all the mobile is being fixed. <laughs> mediocre husbands, mediocre wives, pure folks when they could be silver and gold folks, mediocre home life. Mediocre children with not the proper respect for parents and parents living that mediocre life, not setting the precept and example that they should before their children. So much mediocrity we find in home life today. Somebody said about old philosopher James, he had a ponderous way of saying nothing in infinite sentences. Well, I think that's mediocrity. Mm -hmm. You know, the noted biographer of, of Solomon Grundy, don't you? 
Salmon Grande, born on Monday, christened on Tuesday, married on, on Wednesday, sick on Thursday, worse on Friday, died on Saturday, dead on Sunday. Thus ends the life of Solomon Grande. <laughs> Mediocrity set forth there. I read an article not so long ago that brought me to tears and to heartache and prayer. It was written under this question, do we need a Gideon's purge among Southern Baptists? Do we need a Gideon's purge among Southern Baptists? Do we have so many folks? No, we don't have too many folks. We have too many folks who are mediocre folks, so I say that with love to our Southern Baptist Convention. David Brainerd, the great missionary to the Indians who died young, yet who lived with an influence that'll never die. During the will of God, he abided forever, said, don't take it enough to live according to the commonplace religion now present. And the great poet Robert Browning, I used to read him and I memorized that long poem Saul. I don't know whether I could say any of it now or not. That's back when I was young, you know. When you get old, you have to forget like old Dr. Staley over in Sumville, South Carolina. He went, they had a new postmistress when Mr. Hoover was elected president. She was a Republican lady and they put out the Democratic lady that, put in the Republican lady and he went down he said I want my mail please and he didn't know her and she didn't know him she said what's your name and he couldn't think of it <laughs> now he told this himself he said he said I'm the forgiveness man in the world so I couldn't think of my name so I went down the street and somebody said hey Dr. Staley I said that's it that's it <laughs> I went down I said Dr. Staley is my name You know what the great poet Robert Browning, who wrote so many marvelous things, said about a preacher? The preacher talks through his nose. Firstly, he talks through his nose. And secondly, his language is ungrammatic. And thirdly, the way of that which is pedagogic, his subject matter lacks logic. Now that I've known the worst of him, I wonder what I thought I'd obtain first from him, and so I praise his heart and pity the head of him and turn, O oh God, to thee. And that's what he said about a preacher. I wonder if we're guilty as preachers sometimes, the glorious gospel to preach, preaching some old social mess, instead of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll never have a regenerate society until you have regenerate people. You're not going to get that except when you preach the word. Amen. The word of God. I remember what Dr. Mullins, one time president of our Southern Seminary and also of our Southern Baptist Convention, said in his book, The Lordship of Christ. Listen to what he said now. He said, The chief difficulty with us is that so many Christians think in conventional terms. They're smug and complacent and have no desire to be daring and to do great things for God. Jesus did not come to subdue sparrows or catch rabbits. What's he talking about? Jesus wasn't dealing in mediocre things. Lord Chesterton, in agreement with Dr. Mullen, said Jesus was a lion tamer. No, he didn't come to catch sparrows or subdue rabbits. He was a lion tamer. I wonder if old Dr. Parker didn't sniff something of mediocrity when he said the great congregation was, the world is tired of programs an inch long. And I think Dr. Gamble, our great old commoner president of our Southern Baptist Convention on one occasion, more in lamentation and heartache than in criticism, said, we Baptist people are many, but we ain't much. <laughs> and we ain't much when it comes to putting this liquor business out of business. We ain't much when it comes to a lot of other things in the world. I think he said it in lamentation and heartache rather than in criticism. We come to a place where we need to get out of the realm of mediocrity and get in the world of the magnificent and live the magnificent life in all things. Be maximum men, not minimum men. That's what God wants us to be. Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away these childish things. And Jesus said to what shall I like in the man of this generation? 
I liken them unto children playing in the marketplace and saying, We packed up to you and you wouldn't dance, and we mourned and you wouldn't weep. Petty children. The Bible tells us that God stirred up a man by the name of Hadad against Solomon. Now, Hadad was a grown man, and the Bible says this, he fled because Hadad was as a little child. was old enough to get married, was old enough to be head of an army. He married a sister-in-law of Pharaoh. He wasn't a baby, but the Bible says he was a baby. He was a mediocre man, and so the Bible called him a child. Let's go back to what Jesus said again. To what shall I like in the man of Albuquerque, of New Mexico, of our Southern Baptist Convention? So is God going to liken us to children playing in the marketplace? Saying, we pack to you and you wouldn't dance, we mourn and you wouldn't weep. Boo hoo, boo hoo. Children pout. I know a lot of grown folks that pout. Children get offended. I know a lot of folks who get offended. Folks in the choir get offended. I remember once we had over in the First Baptist Church at Chester, I sat like the moderator sitting with a little lady right behind me. She, I don't know what she's saying. Sometimes soprano and tenor and bass and <laughs> every sort of thing. And I went to superintendent of Sunday school. I said, Brock, why don't you get Miss Vivian on the choir? I said, oh, preach. I'm in a, I'm a superintendent of school. She, had, she got a lot of kinfolk. Don't get me in trouble. <laughs> so I went to Brother Jake Perkins, the chairman of the deacons, and I said, one of the best men I've ever known. And I said, Brother Jake, you know what's wrong about choir? I said, yes, I've been knowing for seven years, preaching. I said, why don't you get Miss Dilly now? Said, oh, no, not me. I got I got a grocery store here, and I, I, I don't want to miss selling groceries. She got a whole lot of kin folks. I miss Daisy with the combination organist and choir director, and I said, Miss Daisy, why don't you get Miss Vivian out of the choir? I said, oh, preacher, not now. You know my husband, the mayor, and he's going to run again. <laughs> and she got a lot of kin folks. Brother Jake Perkins for me said, Preacher, you want Miss Vivian out of the choir? I said, Yes, of course I do. He said, Well, why don't you ask her? You're the pastor. Why don't you get her out? I said, Okay. She worked up in the department store, and I went up. She had a bolt of cloth, you know, and she's measured, and she had a customer. And she said, Hi, Preacher, I'll talk to you in a minute when I get through my customer. And when the customer left, she said, Now, nah, Preacher, how you do? I said, I'm just fine, Miss Vivian. What can I do for you? I said, Miss Vivian, I. I want you to get out of the choir. <laughs> and she said, well, you think it'd be good for the church if I'd get out? I said, it surely would, Miss Bibby. It'd be good for me, too. <laughs> because she stood right behind me when she sang. I don't know what it was, a combination of alto, soprano, and bass, whatever it was. And she said, I preach it if you think it's good for the church. And and good for you and good for the choir for me to get out, I'll get out. But I'm going to tell you one thing. You're not going to stop me from singing in the congregation. <laughs> Go ahead and sing. <laughs> Got all the time. The preacher asked Miss Vivian out. Miss Vivian asked Miss Vivian out. All the folks are getting mad with him now. Oh, all the kin folks get mad with him. But she didn't get mad. I went through Chester after I left the pastor. I went through there on a seaboard train back in those days when you could use trains. <laughs> a lot of young people came down in midnight train to say hi to me, two or three hundred of them. I saw Miss Vivian over there in the, in the crowd. I said, hi, Miss Vivian. Hey, preacher. I said, you singing in the choir yet? No, not yet, but you ought to hear me in the congregation. <laughs> I grant you that she was a magnificent Christian. Amen. Nothing mediocre about her attitude or about her doing what she believed the preacher needed to have done for the good of the choir of the church. A lot of children get offended and they get, you know, uh, people talk about a, a little baby, just a little darling. I never saw a little baby, a little darling in my life, a little angel, I mean. The most selfish thing in this world is a little baby. Just give me, give me, give me. If you don't give me, give me. <laughs> you know that. You were that way when you was a little thing. I was that way. Just give me, give me, give me. And a lady in our church said, 
Dr. Lee, we want you and Miss Lee to come over to our house one night for supper. said, I want you to know my children real well. I said, oh, I know your children. She, she said, you know, I named my boy for you. I said, yes, I know that too. She said, I've spoken to him in his Sunday school. Said, you know, he's a little angel. I said, are you an angel? She said, no, sir. I said, your husband an angel? No, sir. I said, how can you have an angel? <laughs> There's Milton who wrote the world's greatest epic. What would you think of him if he wrote some silly stuff and gave himself absolutely to, to mediocre writing? Over here in Georgia, the, the fellow wrote a little verse about Miss Nancy Jones. She died. She was a good Christian lady, but she never had married. A young lady came to me not long ago. She said, Dr. Lee, I don't think I'm ever going to get married. I just... I guess I'm, I'm going to be an old maid because you told me not to marry any man that drank and said the fellow I go with drinks. I said, well, it's lots better for you to be an old maid than to wish you were one sometime. I went to this newspaper editor, a little weekly paper, W-A-K, you know, you can spell it twice. Two ways, I mean. I want him to write an epitaph for Miss Nancy Jones. He said, I can't write an epitaph for an old maid. I just can't do it. He said, I can write about a bullfight, a baseball game, but don't ask me to write an epitaph for an old maid. If you don't do it, we won't subscribe for your paper and we won't advertise in it. So boy, that boycott, he wrote it. And it came out next week, said what he said. Here lie the bones of Nancy Jones. For her death had no terror. She lived an old maid. She died an old maid. No hits, no runs, no error. Now, what, what do you think of Lucy? Give me his life to writing some nonsense like that. Mediocrity the sad thing. I think God wants us to be maximum people, not midget people. You said, Jesus said, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. Not a little bit of fruit, but much fruit. That's being magnificent, not just mediocre, not halfway, but all the way. We need people in this world today, men and women, who lead people out of the mediocre into the magnificent, out of do littleness and do nothingness into doing much for the Lord Jesus Christ. I heard a Presbyterian preacher say in Philadelphia, if 40 men died in my church, I'd be flat on my back. All of us preachers know that if an automobile had as many useless parts as some churches we've been passed around, it wouldn't run down a hill. You know that as well as I know it. Mediocrity in the world today. I love to think about Moses when the town of the tabernacle was going in. Let me, let me turn to it and see just what it says about it. I wonder how that would do if we'd apply it to our Southern Baptist life, to our own churches. Listen here what it says. And the, they speak unto Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. And Moses gave commandments, and they called it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let nothing, let no, neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the, of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing, for the stuff they had was sufficient for all their work to make it, and too much. Now that's magnificent, is mm -hmm. Easy we. You know we love to see magnificent people, don't we? Abraham Lincoln said, I love to see a man preach like he's fighting hornets. Sometimes we, well, I'm a preacher, you know. And I, I, I knew the worst champion marksman, the worst champion marksman for 35 years. Only man in the sports world ever won 1,200 trophies. Now, I have most of them except the 173 that were stolen. That man has a record of 11,000 shots with just one miss. Came up to Memphis to shoot the last time I saw him alive. And he missed one out of 400. And he turned to me with a sort of a sneer on his lips. And some of the fellows said, Hey there, Pack! 
You must be drunk to miss one. Miss one out of four, and that's magnificent. But you know, he practiced sometimes four to six hours a day. He practiced, he practiced, he practiced, and used over 600,000 cells in his practice over a period of years. Magnificent! I knew Ty Carl. Had a batting average of 327 for 24 years, 367 for 24 years. I used to live in 28 miles of him when I was at the edge of South Carolina. He talked to me once, and he said, Bob, I always enjoy doing my best. And you know I'm not as mean as these newspaper fellows say I am. Can I do sit out on the dugout and sharp my spike so the other team can see him? <laughs> Only man in baseball ever went to second base on a walk. <laughs> I saw a man I wore, I saw him rubbing him off with silk, silk handkerchiefs. No ordinary calico for man of war. Old oh, Sandy said when I rode him in the best, best race he ever ran, said he reminded me of a runaway locomotive. I knew Joe Jack. Joe Jack was a South Carolina boy. I used to carry newspapers in Greenville, South Carolina. And when I wound up my newspaper route, it was down at the old Southern Railway Station where he had a little old cafe. And he sometimes, early in the morning, six in the morning, maybe earlier, he'd say, Hey, kid, come in here. You don't have anything to eat over there at that old house or lawn. And come in and get you something to eat. He used to play baseball barefooted on his soft feet. The reason, the reason they called him Shoeless Joe. One day he came in from the outfield in Chicago, just a fuss, and glass in that outfield! Glass in that outfield! And you said, cutting your feet, Joe? No! Roughing up that ball, something terrible. <laughs> oh, my goodness! <laughs> I think of Tom Brumby, the hero of Manila. Came back to Atlanta, and Georgia was proud of that hero, and they gave him a big banquet down there. The governor was there, and the United States Senator there, beautiful women, beautifully dressed there. Great long table with silver table, silken uh, linen tablecloths, and, and, and cut glass, and, and, and china ware, and, and spoons, and silvers, and, and wine bottles, and wine glasses. Toastmaster got up and said, ladies and gentlemen, we're so glad to have our hero with us tonight, and I propose that he give a toast to our flag and wine. Tom Brumby rose and said, ladies and gentlemen, and he said it very quietly and humbly. Dr. Broughton's the one who told me all about this. He was there. He said, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate this banquet giving them my honor, but I do not drink wine, and I will not toast the flag under which I risk my life in wine. Amen. That night there wasn't a wine bottle on coke, and every wine glass was turned top side down and bottom side up. And Dr. Broughton said, Lee, I preached against liquor many times in Atlanta, but the greatest someone ever preached against liquor in Atlanta was when Tom Brumby said, I do not drink wine, and I will not toast the flag under which I risk my life in wine. Magnificent! I think of Mahalia Jackson. I passed the First Baptist Church in New Orleans. I went out to a Negro Baptist Church where I preached one afternoon. You know, I can preach to those folks. They give you some amens, and our average congregation day to say amen is like shooting a pistol. <laughs> when I got through, the pastor said, Doctor, I, I want you to meet a little singing gal here, a little, she's just seven years of age, maybe not quite that, little brown, black-faced girl came up, she said, her name's Mahalia Jackson, she said, I want you to listen to her sing. And she sang. When I was in Paris, I picked up the French newspaper and read it in the, in the English section. I don't know much French. I can say yes in it, French. And I read where she used to be at the Opera House that night. And I phoned my dear missionary friends, Art and Muriel Johnson. I said, Art, do you and Muriel ever go to the theater or Opera House? He said, no, we never have. I said, well, I want you to go tonight as my guest. I want you to hear Mahalia Jackson sing. And we went. 3,000 people there. Some of them didn't understand English, but they 
got what the message some way, some did understand English. Would well, you know what she sang? She didn't sing in these anthems in foreign tongue that some of our choir directors put off on us. Oh, excuse me, sir. <laughs> excuse me, sir. <laughs> When I first went to Bellevue, the choir got up and sang, Oh, I had the wings of a dove. They haven't sung it since. <laughs> Unless they sung it since I gave up my pastor. I think of somebody getting up singing, Oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I think of some old bass with little wings of a dove flying away. <laughs> you know what she sang that night? Out of my bondage, sorrow, night, into thy freedom, gladness, and my Jesus, I come to thee. Saints, daughter of my everlasting portion, more than a friend or life to me, all along my pilgrim journey, Savior, let me walk with thee. She sang, Rock of Ages, what a friend we have in Jesus. Amen. On the other side of Jordan, the sweet fields of Eden, where the tree of life is blooming, there's rest for the weary, there's rest for me. Amen. Oh, what a night it was. Magnificent. Yeah, before last, she was offered $25,000 a week to sing in a nightclub out here at Las Vegas. I don't know how far it is, but I can't get too far away from it. <laughs> and you know what she said? When she was offered $25,000 a week to sing in a nightclub, she said, I never sing where they serve liquor. She couldn't sing at some banker's banquets in Albuquerque, could she? Because they serve liquor at she couldn't sing at some bankers' banquets they've had in Memphis because they served liquor at her. She couldn't sing at some cocktail party because they served liquor. Right now. God wants us to be magnificent in faith, in love, in sacrifice, in service, and in unselfishness. You know, I could talk a long time. Maybe I ought to quit right now. Anyway, my summons are like strings of baloney sausage. Cut them off anywhere, they're good on both ends. So, <laughs> oh, listen to me! <laughs> Begin to get out of, the, out of the realm of the mediocre in the matter of money. Yes, we do. I met with finance committees in my life that had faces some time long enough to eat ice cream out of a churn. <laughs> well, how are they going to buy this? How are they going to get that? How are they going to put carpets? How are they going to get a piano? How are they going to raise a preacher's salary? How are they going to? How are they going to? How are they going to? And God had it right here. Bring the tower to my house and make an offering in addition. That's right. Amen. This book says the tenth is the Lord's. It's holy under the Lord. God is not mine. Listen, mister, if you're married, your wife is your, your wife and no other man. You don't say, well, that's, that's more than I can afford. <laughs> Little lady, if you're married, your husband is your husband and no other woman. You don't say, well, you know, I, you're expecting too much of me to believe that. But when it comes to the tent and when it comes to loving God with our pocketbooks, we're so many times we're mediocre. That's right. Think of people who claim to be Christians who won't give God one dime out of a dollar, nor one watermelon out of ten, nor one bill of cotton out of ten. Shame it is. Shame it is. I just can't afford, you can't afford not to. And I'll tell you something. Nine cents will go further than ten cents when you pay God his ten. And ten cents will go if you pay God his ten. I was pastor of the First Baptist Church in Edgefield, South Carolina. Oh, I love that little town. I strum Thurman's pastor when he was a young man with an ambition to be governor. He became governor and he's United States Senator today, one of the great Christian statesmen we have in Washington. Amen. And we had a debt on that little church. He just had 243 members when I got there and I found seven of them in the cemetery and some others headed for it. <laughs> church over eleven thousand dollars and every time i'd have a deacons meeting the finance committee meeting how are we going to pay interest on the debt they were paying eight percent interest on the debt didn't have a preacher's home i had a little old shack of a house and i had to hold the umbrella over the hole in the roof when to keep the rain out of the skillet when my wife was frying bacon until i got the whole thing 
I'm not telling you a joke. I'm telling you church history. Thank you, man. piece of study and it's so small you almost had to get out in the hall to change your mind or to work your mind. And <laughs> one night I got out on my knees and had a little study and I said, Lord, I'm tired of this debt. Every time I have a deacon meet, Lord, all they talk about is paying the interest on the debt and they seem to be more interested in interest than they are in anything else. I said, Lord, Lord, help me. I want that debt paid off. And you know what God said to me? I don't mean he talked out loud like I'm talking. He said, quit your praying. I've heard your prayer. Next Sunday, tell the folks you're going to pay it off the following Sunday, and they'll pay it off. I went down to the breakfast table the next morning. My, my little girl, when she got her oatmeal scattered all over the table as though she had a rich daddy. <laughs> and I said, I said to my wife, we've been married over 56 years, you know. I said to her, you know what I'm going to do, honey? She said, no telling. She said that, yes. <laughs> no telling what my husband's going to do, what he's going to say if he feels like he ought to do it or say it. She said, no telling. I said, well, I'm going to tell the people next Sunday morning we're going to pay off our church debt the following Sunday. I got it from the Lord. And I said, I'm not going to say a word to anybody in the world about it. I'm not going to tell a deacon. I'm not going to tell a single human being except you. And don't you tell it. She said, I'm not going to tell it. But she said, you know what you're doing? I said, yes, I know what I'm doing, honey. I want you to see my congregation. had a little hurdy goody auditorium. You turn your back, turn to talk to the folks over here. You had your back to these over here and turn to talk to these over here. You had your back to those over there. I'm sorry for a quiet have to look at a man's back head all the time. Anyway, we had old Governor Shepherd, you know, Edgefield little town sent ten governors to the governor's chair. Used to say unless you're from Edgefield you can't be elected governor. Well, Governor Pickens and Borman, Tillman and Timmerman, Strum, Thurman, all those. And old Governor Shepard was out there. He, his place at Mark where he used to sit and he had a, he used to wear a long tail coat and a high, high collar and a, one of these big fluffy egg ties and a white vest and a big watch chain and he had a silver headed, a gold headed woman cane. Put that thing down on the floor. If I talk about the grace of God, it's still as that. If I'd say, the tent is the Lord, it'll wiggle. <laughs> I could talk about how far God would take our sins from us when we put our trust in Christ, and just as still as that. If I'd say, honor the Lord with our substance. <laughs> Anything I'd say about money, it would wiggle. So I got up that morning over in that little church. They sang my favorite hymn, Majestic Sweetness Sits in Throne. I said, brethren and sisters, I have an announcement I want to make. I said, I haven't told anybody about it. I haven't mentioned a single person in this world except my wife. She hasn't mentioned to anybody. And I said, next Sunday morning, we're going to pay off our church debt. <laughs> Governor Shepard, ex-governor then, but he had been governor, he got, jumped up and he said, Do I hear him? I hear the right. And his brother Orlando, who was church clerk, got up and quietly said, That's what our young preacher said. The emphasized young one, he did preach it. <laughs> and I said, Now, we're going to pay it off next Sunday morning. I said, But nobody must give over $500. If he gives over $500, I give all this over 500 back to him. Well, if I'd thrown some dynamite on the church lawn, I couldn't have started that congregation anymore. <laughs> I went out the door to shake hands with the people, and, and attorney Strum Thurman's father, attorney general of South Carolina, came by, and all he said to me was this, how'd it do? <laughs> and I heard him say to the organist as, as he went out and spoke to her, he said, fine young preacher, fine young preacher, very unpractical, very unpractical. <laughs> And all over town, the little telephone girl said, Dr. Don't ever announce about a church debt anymore. She said, I made more connections and heard more people talking about church debt and folks don't wonder if you're going to get it or not. I'd go downtown, folks would say, Preach, you think you're going to get that money next Sunday? I said, unless God dies. I said, you haven't heard about him being dead, have you? <laughs> One day I'd go down the street and the fellow Bragg Jones, B.B. Jones, they called him Big Bragg. 
one of the richest men in town, had lived in a mansion of a house, president of the bank, and had a big furniture store, and he hadn't been to church since I went there because he'd fallen out with the church. He saw me say, hey, come over here. And I went over there, and he said, are you the new preacher, aren't you? I said, yeah, where you been all this time? He didn't answer that. And I understood you told the people you were going to pay off the church debt next Sunday morning. I said, I told them they were going to do it. He said, I told you, and I understand you didn't mention anybody about it when you made your knife. I said, nobody but my wife. And you understand? I understand you said, all had to be cash. I said, yeah, all got to be cash. Nobody must give over 500. Is that what you said? I said, yeah, that's what I said. He said, well, I want to tell you one thing. You either got more grit and less sense than any preacher have been this time. Went back to his said, come back in. He took one of those old roll top dishes, you know, and you, I think Mr. Sherman used it on his march to the sea, like that, you know. And I had a checkbook and began to write, and I looked over his shoulder, told that old scratchy pen like some of these post office pens, you know, but the music was sweeter than the Westminster chimes. <laughs> and he, he, wrote out a, he wrote out a check for $500 and gave it to me and said, nah, you take it, says. Anybody ask if old Bragg Jones is going to give anything, just tell him what you please. I took that thing and pulled it up and put it in my pocket, and I'd go down the street, and I'd take it out and look at it and grin. And I saw three fellas on that corner talking. I just walked right by and said, Hey, preacher, aren't you going to preach, speak to us? I said, Well, that depends on whether you're going to give anything on the church debt next Sunday. I said, If you're not, you're not worth speaking to. And I went on. <laughs> Where are you going? I said, I'm going to the hospital. What are you going to the hospital for? I said, I'm going to have my ears moved back so my face can hold a smile. Next Sunday when we peel off the day. Ooh! I had a good time. <laughs> the next Saturday night, I woke up about midnight and I punched my wife and I said, Honey, did you hear that? She said, Yeah, I've been here for two hours. <laughs> Old Jupiter Pruis was on a drum. Rain and old muddy sidewalks and old muddy streets pouring down rain, 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 rain. Went down to church, those church crammed full. Folks that hadn't been to church in 15 years, I think some of them came to mark, but if they did, they remained to pray. Two folks were saved that day, folks had wanted to be saved a, and hadn't been saved in a long time. Now, my governor. Got up, Miss Now, brethren and sisters, it's time for us to pay off our church debt. And I said, we want to understand how we're going to do it. It all must be cash. Nobody must give over $500. I want to have the honor of self giving the first $500. <laughs> I said, Governor, I'm sorry, but somebody beat you to it. And I dropped Brad Jones' check down on the table. And I said, now, Governor, the way I want this thing done, I want everybody to tell his name, tell what he's going to bring, and bring it down. He said, my name is John C. Shepard. I'll give you $500. I said, come on down, Governor. Oh, we have this Abner Broadwater, the biggest man physical I've ever been past. Of. Oh, and he and his little wife sitting over there. He's a big man, the most polite man I ever saw. So I saw him get up one day. You three ladies this seat. He got up. <laughs> He said, he said, my, my, my name's Abner Broadwater, I'll give you $500, and, and, and the little wife got up and said, my name's Fanny Broadwater, I'll give you $200. I said, Miss Broadwater, is that your money? I said, you know, I said, nobody must give over $500. Yes, it's my money, he got nothing to do with my money. I said, come on down, honey, come on down. <laughs> and it went on that way, and little old Billy Sutton got up and said, Ah, uh, my name Billy Sutton. I give you five bucks all I got. He had one freckle that's all over his face. <laughs> Little Gladys Lyon worked in a ten cent store, said, My name is Gladys Lyon, I give you a hundred dollars. It went that way and that way and that way. And I said, Now I want everybody to give something. One man got up and said, Well, my name is Betty Scandalou. He said, uh, he said uh, the lightning struck my barn, burned it up, but I still love the Lord. I give you two hundred and fifty dollars. Thus it went, I told Mr. Lott, and I said, Brother Lott, you the treasure, take this money and go back, and I'll send two deacons to chaperone you, you count it, and let us know how much we got. We sang till they came back, and Brother Lott looked up at me, I can see his face right now, even though he's in glory. As it was that morning, he said, Pastor, and his chin began to tremble, his cheeks came down, uh, stained with tears, and he said, 
Pastor, we're glad to report that the people today have given $14,600. <laughs> oh, what a day. What a day. Magnificent people. Magnificent faith. Magnificent service. Emptying their pocketbooks, some of them, for the cause of Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to be magnificent in any realm with our bodies mastered and our money mastered. We must be mastered by the master. He's the greatest master of all, and anybody who doesn't let Christ master his body and his life is just as foolish as engineer who expects his locomotive to run with cold water. Yes, he is. Jesus said, If any man serve me, him will my father honor. We need to be mastered by Jesus, who today is heaven's bread for us hunger, heaven's water for us thirst, heaven's light for us darkness, heaven's glory for us shame, heaven's grace for us guilt, heaven's peace for us strife, heaven's wisdom for us folly, heaven's justification for us condemnation, heaven's salvation for us damnation. We need to be mastered by Him. Amen. Christ is abroad in His chariot of gravity, but. He's a broad, more powerful, and a dedicated life or life. I heard Winston Churchill speak once. Oh, could I ever forget it? He said, General Wagon tells us what he calls the bottle of France is over. The bottle of Britain is about to begin. On the issue of this bottle depends the fate of our commonwealth and the entire empire. Hitler knows he must beat us in this island or lose the war. Therefore, we shall so bear ourselves to our duty and so conduct ourselves that if the empire lost a thousand years, men would say of us, this was their finest hour. Oh, would the Baptists in our Southern Baptist Convention, over 11 million of us now, oh, the Baptists in New Mexico and my Tennessee state and all our states, would so bear ourselves to our duty and so let Christ master us that angels in heaven and the devils in hell should say, this is a fine hour for New Mexico Baptists, a fine hour for Southern Baptists. We need to pray the prayer which I wrote down that a converted Mexican, educated Mexican man wrote. I think I have a copy of it here. If I don't, I can give it to you anyway. So, oh Lord, I'm just a string. Make me a lie, a wire I'm just a drop. Make me a fountain. I'm just a little hill. Make me a mountain. I'm just a link, make me a chain. I'm just a king. I'm just a slave, make me a king. Oh, Lord, make me magnificent. May that be our prayer. I thank you for listening to me this long time. I'd like you to bow your head before somebody prays. I don't know who's to pray. Say to the Lord Jesus, as you talk just to him, Lord Jesus, help me, and I'm going from this place tonight, back to my church, back to my home, and be a magnificent somebody for thee. Say that to him with bowed head, will you please?